we got to talk about today? Just because back, you've already read Unit 1, you've done some of the questions, you might not have fully understood what the questions were asking you, uh, but some of the things, like I said, with temperature measurement, we discussed the other day. <coughs> what were some of the things we talked about with temperature measurement? What did we have you do? What did you do last class? We calculated how to um, convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit to Rankin. Rankin. Okay, so yeah, what was the Rankin? What was the Rankin and then the other one? What was the other one? Kelvin. Kelvin. Yeah, what were those? What do we call those? Absolute. The absolute temperature scales, yes. Whereas we got the other one. We're going to talk today a little bit more about heat transfer as well as the types of heat that you're going to come in contact with. Pressure. You don't have to write any of this right there. And then we're going to kind of show uh, a little bit of things called latent heat, sensible heat, and graphing that out. That's what that graph paper is for. So first off, talk about heat measurements. Really, there's temperature. What we're talking about with temperature is just a measurement of the heat intensity. So if you just want, you don't have to write all this, but just write temperature equals intensity. Intensity. I'm not talking about quantity. We're not talking about how much. We're talking about the intensity. How intense it is. In other words, everything we talked about was vibrating. The more that substance is on a molecular level vibrating, the faster the electrons are moving, the more intense the heat's going to be. It doesn't say anything, though, about the amount of electrons we have or amount of whatever the substance is we have. It just says something about the state's intensity at that particular moment. Fahrenheit's what we normally use here in the United States, but if you're from somewhere else or if you go somewhere else, you might run into Celsius. Like we said, Rankin and Kelvin were the absolute temperature scales. You don't need to write that down. We have it on our other sheet. What I do want you to write down is this. This term we're going to be starting to introduce to you, the British Thermal Unit. It now deals with heat quantity. It's the quantity of heat now. So now we talked about the temperature of something. Now we need to talk about how much heat something has at that temperature. All of our heating and air conditioning equipment is sized on this. And we're going to talk about that. Like the other day, we talked about the temperature here. Of, what is that? Ice. We talked about the temperature of ice. What temperature I know is that ice right now? 32 degrees. Yep. It's got to be at least 32 degrees. Could even be colder. If it was in a refrigerator or freezer that was 20 degrees below zero, that ice could get down to 20 degrees below zero. The heat intensity could drop even lower, as low as I want, as low as I can get with a mechanical or uh, other type of system. They got a rule here. They say one BTU will raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. A lot of people think that's the definition of a BTU. Really, the definition is it is a heat quantity. This is a basic law that we use. So it takes, if I had a pound of water here, Right? When you get one of these jugs, it's really 16.9 fluid ounces. How many ounces in a pound? How many ounces in a pound? So if I have one pound of something, if I put it on this scale right here, oh look, I got a pound there. Right? What what would that be? No, it says 1.14. So something had to reset. Let's see here, what is this? Oh, uh, that's just four and a half ounces. So it's probably going to be something in ounces that equals a pound. So how many ounces equals a pound? So here, what do we got here? Oh, this is 12.2. So that's still not quite a pound because we haven't flipped over on the pound digit yet. Add a little bit more. Let's see if this is going to be more or less than a pound here. Oh, it's a little bit more. Did you see what it flipped to, though, before it went off? Oh, 15.6, and then it flipped to one pound. So how many ounces are in a pound then? What's right above 15.6? 16. So there are 16 ounces of a substance in a pound. For example, this is about one ounce of copper tubing right here. All right, you got that down? 16 ounces equals one pound. When, when I write something up here, I should see your little hands moving down there, right? And then you also have now, so it takes one BTU. Well, what is one BTU? One BTU is like one matchstick. You have one matchstick. One match, like this right here. And if I was to take a match 
and strike it, what do you think the temperature of that flame would be? How hot is a flame? What do you think? You touch the flame, what happens? Burn yourself. What happens to your skin when you touch that flame? Heats up. Heats up. Yeah, but what happens physically if you were to stick your hand in a flame? It, bubble up. it will bubble up. What does that mean when it bubbles up? What happens when water bubbles up? What do we call that? Boil. And then what do we say about our temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, the boiling point of water? 212. Yep, you're right on the money. 212. So if the temperature of the flame has got to be hotter than... 212 degrees. So, because it would burn you if you touched it, it would bubble up, even just that little bit, because it doesn't have a lot of heat quantity now, right? But yeah, give me a number. What do you think the temperature of a flame is? If I struck that match, what would the temperature of the flame be? Give me a number. What? 212? Probably hotter than 212. A little bit hotter. Good number, though. 300 to 400 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe. Like about the temperature of the torch. Right? For solder and brazen. That's our range that we want to start melting metal. Right? Tin and tinimony, the mixture. We can melt that between three and four hundred degrees. But I don't think if you lit a match, do you see any solder, that roll melting? Would it melt, you think, if you lit the match and put it under? It's a three, four hundred degree flame, so yeah, it should. But what is the deal with the match? What's going to happen before it really heats up the metal? It'll go out. So you have another match, right? You ever seen these? Somebody got a fireplace at home that's not a natural gas? Maybe you do have one that's natural gas installed by Cypress here. They're one of our business partners, right? So, but if not, then you got uh, a big long match like this to light off the wood. Why do they make the match so long? You ever seen those? They come in a little round can. You can get them at the store. You never seen them? Man, I gotta go get a set. I gotta go get a set and bring them in. They're a long match like this, and they're wooden, and they're for people that have fireplaces, or like if you wanna start a cookout, it's before they came out with those long lighters that you could click. It was so that you could keep your hand far enough away for when the fire started to take off, because usually you stuff it with paper to get it going, and it would go off. And people that have little matches, well, they burn their fingers. So they made a longer match so that you could hold it further away while you were lighting off the fire. But look at this, if this was like one BTU's worth of heat. Let me ask you this first. It has the same stuff as what's on the end of a match, you know? What causes that? What do you smell? Phosphorus, yeah. And it smells like what when you burn it? Ever smelled it? Like rotten eggs? Smells like sulfur? Sort of after you burn a, burn a match? Yeah, but it's phosphorus. It burns off real quick. Phosphorus here, phosphorus here on the end of both matches. Any reason to think the temperature would be different when I struck it? No? That's right. It'd be about 300 to 400 degrees. It's made of the same stuff as the little match. There's no difference. But which one would burn longer? Yeah, in fact, I could probably fit one, two, three, four, five matches of the one BTU match, the little one that you get, you know, from some of the stores or wherever you go. And then this one here holds like five of those. So this one really is equal to like five BTUs worth of heat. So now if I took this one match and I held it under this one pound of water, 16 ounces, all right, it would raise the water from 70 degrees then to what? If one BTU raises one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit, and the temperature of this water is 70 degrees, and I burn a match under it, what's the temperature of the water going to be after the match all burns off? 71. But if I burn this match under it, right? Pretend the plastic wouldn't melt. Let's say I had it in a, a metal pan. But if I had this match under it right here and I held it under the 70 degree water and let it burn, how much would that raise then? Five degrees. Yes, you're getting it. So we got a temperature change. We're dealing with temperature, usually in degrees Fahrenheit for us. And now we're talking about heat quantity, how much heat we can add to a substance. And for water, the ratio is one to one to one. Every match I was to burn underneath here, right, is going to raise that water one degree Fahrenheit. Up to what temperature, though? What's the highest temperature I can go with water at sea level? What temperature did you say earlier that water boils at? 212. 212. That's it. We cannot get water when it's open to the atmosphere 
higher than 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So what I'm going to do over here is we're going to go ahead and we're going to start boiling and make sure, verify with our thermometer that it's reading 212 degrees. So we'll turn on the gas here. We'll fire it up. Let me know when it starts to boil. All right. So we're going to verify that that's going to get up to 212 degrees. So now it's like me just going under there and lighting a bunch of matches. And that right there is about a pound of water in that flask. Okay. And then we'll switch it to temperature probe number two. Temperature of the water right now is 93. Okay. So it should be quick once it starts to heat up. We're going to go ahead and let that burn over there while we continue on with our lesson here. Okay. Some other things about heat transfer. Oh, look, there's the measuring temperature we did the other day. Fahrenheit, Celsius. You don't need to write this. You already have this on that other worksheet that you did. The other notes. But yes, we're looking for reference points. 212, 32, water boils, water freezes. There's your formulas. Same thing. All right. So with the temperature increase, right now, what am I doing to the molecules in the water? Yeah, they're starting to move faster. There's, everything's getting more intense in there. So what's going to happen is turn the heat off, take away that energy, move slower. We can slow it, slow it down almost. What happens here? When it gets so slow, it turns into what? A solid, yeah, ice. Just about everything has that path with the exception of carbon dioxide. And then we talked about absolute zero. That's where we froze that molecular motion. There's no more electrons spinning, there's no vibration, there's no nothing as far as we know. And they haven't gotten there yet. They're within, I think, two tenths of a degree almost. But when we talk about absolute zero, there's absolute temperatures at zero Rankin, zero Kelvin. That's it. So if you're to look at it here on a thermometer again, comparing the two, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this. But that thermometer, that's it. That's as low as any thermometer can go, negative 460. No lower number than, somebody tells you they got something colder than, let's say, negative 500 degrees. It's false. It's an alternative fact. It's not true, okay? It's not going to be real. Zero degrees ranking. We did all this yesterday, so it's just a review. Okay? Remember, all you gotta do to find absolute temperature, add 460. So zero degree Fahrenheit, 460 ranking. To find our absolute temperature with Celsius, add 273, because that's as high as we can go, or low as we can go, down on the Celsius scales, negative 273. Somebody tells you they got something negative 275 degrees Celsius, they got that cold? No, it's not, no, no, no. So at 100, just add 273, so 100 degrees Celsius, the boiling point of water is 373 degrees Kelvin. Now, here's where you get to some laws. Can't create this energy. I'm not creating this, I'm converting it. Energy can't be created or destroyed, all right? It can only, like for example, we can't, destroy the heat in something. But we can move it. We can take it from a place we don't want it and put it to a place we don't care about it. And that's what refrigeration is, removing the heat. If you had to ask what the answer or definition is to refrigeration, you could go on and on with a long answer. But the bottom line, removing heat. That's what you're doing with those trainers back there. You're getting ready to start to pressurize them with the refrigerant, make sure they don't have any leaks, so that when you put your hand down in the box, you can feel the heat being removed inside that little box. What we normally do though, it's a bigger box for your house. The whole house is a box though. It might have a bunch of rooms in it, but ultimately what we're doing is we're trying to remove the heat from inside your house, outside the house. Heat always flows warmer to colder. So in other words, you got indoor heat being absorbed by your indoor evaporator coil. That's that thing down in the bottom you hear kick on. That's a coil, indoor coil. And it's gonna absorb the heat in that box. The greater the temperature difference, the greater the heat transfer. Hey. Got a crew coming in. Hey. Yeah, come on in. All right. Josh, go ahead and jump up and give him a little tour. Down this way. Down that way. How we doing? Are we 212 degrees here yet? I can tell you right now, probably not. How do I know that we're not 212 degrees yet? Because it's not really boiling yet. Draw your little house here. Draw the sun. Don't take up the whole paper to do it, but yeah, 
just take a marker, draw a little house, right? And then is what I want you to do, draw the sun over here, okay? Right, 95 degrees right here, okay? And then temperature, what's the temperature in the house mostly? What do you keep your house temperature at? You can walk the thermostat. 70 something, 75, yep. So let's take a look inside the house here. Boom, up, they got it at 70, that's fine. So people keep it at 70. So how is the heat gonna flow? If warm moves to cold, is the temperature going out or is the temperature going in? Warm moves to cold, where's it warmer at? Outside, it's cooler inside. So which way is the heat gonna flow? Inside. That's right. So draw that little arrow and then make sure you put, bottom line here is W to C. Warmer always moves to cooler. We always have heat transfer taking place. If there's anything that's a difference in temperature, it's trying to even out. It's always trying to even out. Sort of like that U2. I blew on one side, I stopped blowing, it evened out. Okay? And then, how much insulation you have in your house, that's not going to stop that heat transfer, that's going to slow it. What do you mean? If it did not have air conditioning, yes, it would not only be the exact temperature, but you not only have the heat, the heat flowing from here, we're going to talk about heat types now next, but you also have radiant heat, the sunlight heat coming in and, and get, you ever laid in a warm spot or walk by a warm spot on the carpet or floor? You know, you see the dog lay there? That heat also, so it could even warm the house up hotter than 95 degrees. Because you have, and then our body heat. The more people you have in a house, you ever been in a room where it's packed and you don't have a lot of heat, like a church or something, you know? You go in there and they don't have air, or they don't, the air feels fine when you first walk in and there's only 10 or 12 people. We generate heat. So yeah, not only do you have the heat trying to get in and infiltrate, they call that. It's infiltrating from outside to inside and warming up the house, but you got all the other things. Lights generate heat. That computer you got running, the Xbox generates heat. Everything is added to the heat load to the house. So what we're trying to do with the HVAC system is find something colder in there. We'll put that coil inside the house, make that coil cold so that all this heat will flow to that coil and then push it outside the house with another coil. How we doing? We boiling yet? We might run out of we might run out of gas. I'm gonna jack up the heat. I'm gonna add more heat BTUs per minute on that little boiler. Moving on. In the winter then. In the winter time. What's happening? We still keep the house about what? The same temperature? Yes. Yeah, well some people like it a little warmer, especially if you don't have a humidifier. The amount of humidity in the system of the house, because the house is a system, will determine what comfortable level you're at. When you have real low humidity, people usually have to turn the temperature up because the moisture is evaporating faster off your skin. Remember we talked about the sweat being 98 degrees, but if you have very low humidity in your house because the heat dries out the air, then it causes that moisture to evaporate faster, which means you always feel cooler. And it's really 70 degrees in the wintertime will feel cooler to you than 70 degrees in the summertime because of the humidity level. In the summer, we have more humid air where the moisture doesn't evaporate off your skin as fast, so therefore you all, you retain the heat. You hold it in a little bit more. All right. So how's this flowing though? Which way is it going? It's going from outside to in, like it did in the summertime? No, it's moving its way out. Yeah, it's going out now because warmer to cooler. And not only that, look, we had like 95 degree, 75 degree house. So the other one was 95. The difference was. 75, what was our delta T? Look at that, difference in temperature. What was the delta T? It was a 20 degree difference. Okay, so remember what we said earlier where heat transfer, the farther away it is, the faster it is. You lose, we gotta oversize the heating more than we do the air conditioning because look at the difference here, 70 minus zero. There's a 70 degree difference, delta, in the winter time between the outside and the inside of the house. And you got a day like today where we have 60 mile an hour winds blowing over that house. We, you feel that wind yesterday with that storm? You hear it? It was blowing all over. It takes, it increases that heat transfer. 
I think the water is good. You think it's good? Are we boiling over? What's the temperature say on the thermometer? 212, 213? If it says 213, it might be touching the bottom. I might have to move it up. Oh, what do we got here? Are you sure? Yeah, it's steam. That's steam. That's nothing else. Are you kidding? That's how we check our food. You're never supposed to smell it like that. You're supposed to whiff the aroma to you. You never cooked in a culinary kitchen before, have you? Uh, all right, you seniors, I can't, I can't fool you. All right, let's take a look at your townhouse again. How many all live in townhouses? Show me your hands. Who's in the townhouse right now? All right, look, you know this. You've lived in it. You go upstairs to go do something, or a few bedrooms upstairs. You know in the summertime, man, you don't want to go to bed, or you do. You like using a sheet. But if you're down in the basement of the townhouse, man, you know what you're doing. You're getting a blanket because the AC's on for the people upstairs, and downstairs, it's freezing cold. It's like... It could be a difference of 10 degrees. So you got a fan motor running. Now this is good while, maybe for sometimes it's good to leave the fan running and circulating the air throughout the house because it's always moving. It really doesn't stagnate. Stagnate means the air kind of stays. It's stationary. Okay, It doesn't move around when the fan motor's not running. But we keep the fan motor running. We're probably going to keep pretty close to even temperatures throughout that townhouse. But as soon as it shuts off, or let's say you got a unit where your parents don't like to run the AC a lot, and they keep the temperature up a little higher than normal, 78, 80, then you're going to feel this dramatic drop of temperature down in the basement because the cold air is falling down and the hot air is moving up. And where do most people have their thermostat in a townhouse out of these three floors? Middle. Right in the middle. So the middle, if you got the thermostat set there, that's the middle. That's probably what the thermostat's going to satisfy too. Satisfy means it's going to shut off at whatever temperature you set it at. So, and then again, you got the 95 degree, you got windows here, that's adding to the heat load up here. We're down in a basement, there's no windows most of the time. Maybe you got a slider in the back, but if you got a deck over that where the sun can't really get, you're not warming anything up. The radiant heat ain't getting to you. So, plus you got 150 degree attic up here, we got a greater temperature difference now. 150 degrees in the attic, 75, 80 degrees here, man, it's trying, the, the, bad. Almost like all child homes need their own independent upstairs unit to maintain true comfort in a home. Or they could do a thing where they zone it. They could shut off the ductwork here, keep the AC running, but stage it down a little bit, and then just make sure that we keep circulating the air up to that top floor and keeping cold air coming out of that vent there. But shutting off definitely the downstairs and maybe throttling back the middle floor a little bit. But you gotta have some special equipment for that. A little bit more on heat transfer. How am I doing on time? Okay, write this down. The three methods. Talk about convection. So this is that hot air rising. The townhouse people that are living in there, you live convectionally every day. You're living with that convectional heat. You can feel it rise, feel the cold air fall. Now, the other one, and, and the fluid could be liquid like my water here, or the fluid could be a air. Conduction is what was happening with that flame. Flame was actually doing two things, providing the last heat transfer I'm going to talk about, and it was touching the bottom of that. It was conducting. Now, conduction is, like right now, I'm conducting all my heat to that thermometer, and the thermometer dial is going up. Thank you. You're welcome. So my heat transfer is happening from molecule to molecule. My molecules are touching the molecules of that, and it's causing the intensity to vibrate more, and it's going up. Radiation is what you, did you feel a little bit of heat his up when I had this on? A little bit? A little? That was the radiant heat you were feeling. The radiant heat, there were invisible rays that you couldn't see. All right, that are going through it. So here we go. If I had a pot like this one here, we had all types of heat transfer going on. You saw the convection. You saw the steam coming up. Some of you could have even seen maybe a little bit of heat happening up with the flame. Okay, that's convection. You touch it. If I was to touch it right now, boom, hot. Hot. Don't touch it. Ouch. Yep. So you got convection. And then there was actually convection. If you've ever seen a pot of water while it gets ready to boil, you can sort of see swirls inside the pot. 
right? And then, I don't know if you ever seen, like, if you ever had to cook eggs, boil eggs, or get over to Roman noodles ready or whatever, you see the pot and you can see the swirls. That's the convection in the water currents. You can actually see water currents before it really heats up. And then the radiant, that's what like Zeppa and Daniel were feeling up here. They could feel a little bit of the radiant heat from that uh, butane torch we got. So, real quick, let's ask a question here. Let's do a little check. So, your furnace is going to fail. It's a cold day. Pretend it doesn't work right now. You get home, you ain't got no... And what's it supposed to do tomorrow? Yeah, so we're going to be cold. So, how's it going to go? Is it cold from the outside? Going to come inside? Is the warmth of your house going to go outside? Or is nothing going to happen if you got enough insulation in the walls? What's it going to be? A, B, C? Anybody? Speed. You got it. Yep. Warmer to cooler. Because it's a cold day outside, hot inside, because you got your furnace on. Warmer to cooler. All right. Now, specific heat. We talked about water being one BTU will raise water what? One degree Fahrenheit. Yep. One to one to one. Ice isn't that way. I got a pound of ice right here. It's 32 degrees. We made sure of it. Now, if my thermometer wasn't working right, and this is actually what I'm going to break you to do now because you've been sitting around for a little while. But look at this right here. So we went, it went up to almost 212. I got the stem dials that you're going to use. But I'm going to go ahead right now and I'm going to make sure that we are reading 32 degrees on my other thermometer. And it's not, it's reading 33. So I have to take a little screwdriver here, a flathead. And this is T1, T1, so I'm going to calibrate it a little bit. Turn it that way, it goes up. Back in time, goes up. Turn it this way, 32. I calibrated the thermometer to make sure it's going to read accurately now from here on out. Now, you're going to do the same thing. I'm going to break you up now. If we know the temperature of this, I got this one pound of ice, we're going to break it up into these little cups. I'm going to give you a little bit of cups here. Right? I'm going to just take it like this. Uh-oh, party. Party time. Yep. Oh. oh, crazy teacher, crazy teacher. All right, I'm going to break you up into groups. We're going to take a little bit of this ice here, and you're going to add a little bit of water to it, just a little bit, because we're going to create what's called an ice bath. I'm going to have to dump this in here like this. We'll dump that in a minute. So you're going to come over here. Just add about a couple ounces of water. So just like shoot it like that. You need to let it sit for two minutes. Now, the tailor-made ones here have a little tool for us to automatically adjust this thermometer. But we know the temperature of the water and the ice is what? Because I just showed you with this thermometer. 32. So you got to shove it through the hole like that. You're going to go ahead and pop it in here like this. And it's got to snap in. It's got to snap into that little piece. All right, and then what you can do is once it locks in and snaps in, we can turn the dial. Let me get it in here. It's a little tight. Some of them are tighter than the others. All right, there it is. It's in. So now, if I put it in this ice bath, right, it should, after I let it sit for a couple minutes, read 32 degrees. It's dropping right now. Don't let it touch the ice, because remember, ice could be colder than 32 degrees. But after a few minutes, if it's not reading 32 degrees, then you got to take it and twist the dial. Oh, look at that. No, we're not at zero. That'd be Fahrenheit. That'd be Celsius. We're Fahrenheit. So I'm going to go ahead. There's 30, and then each one of those dashes means about 2 degrees. So it should be the one dash above the whole line between 20 and 40 right there. Okay? So that's what you're going to do for the last maybe five minutes or so. We'll continue. Hold on to the graph paper. Graphing enthalpy. i got to talk about enthalpy, tonnage, so you know how to size the equipment. And then we can get back to the gauges and talk about that pressure temperature chart. Where we're going is you got to be able to read this in about a week so we can start charging up these AC units with refrigerants, chemicals, which is why you see all the chemistry stuff. Also, I want to talk about later the boiling point of water. But right now, just to review, before I break you up, what we talk about today. We talked about BTU. BTU, yes, that's good. Leave here with the knowledge of the BTU. <coughs> talked about what? BTU. Yep, the British Ice thermal. Heat. Ice, heat, convection. convection, types of heat, convection, what else? Conduction. 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 What is a BTU? What's the measurement? What we, what's a, what? Beach. 
Yeah, one degree raises one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. One BT raises one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. But what is it talking about? What are we talking about? Whereas temperature is a measurement of what? Measurement of intensity. And yes, you said quantity for BGU. Yes, so we got the difference between that. How does heat flow? How is heat always going to flow? Warmer to cooler. Warmer to cooler. Insulation, stop it. Or slow it. Slow it. Slow it. Nothing stop it. But we'll always try and even out. Okay? All right. So let's go ahead. Cut. Break down into groups.